Good evening. My name is Stephen Wood. For those of you who can't read my badge from where you're sat, um, I'm privileged to be able to be a part of the Embassy Bible College, and I absolutely love being around people who are hungry for the Word of God. And you look pretty hungry, even though you've just had a biscuit. <laughs> the first thing I want to say is, you are going to find, when I'm speaking, uh, and particularly when Cindy is speaking at the same time, a lot of overlap of scriptures. We'll both be talking about the same scriptures. And that basically is because there's just the one word. There's just the one Bible. And you can't talk about what I'm going to be speaking about, the integrity of the word of God, without talking about faith as well. And you can't talk about faith without the integrity of the word of God. So there'll be a lot of overlap. But be encouraged. When God causes you to have to hear a scripture more than once, rejoice because it must be an important one. Amen? Yes. Hang on, they're all important. Now that's right. <laughs> Integrity. Adherence to a moral, moral or ethical principle, soundness of moral character, honesty, the state of being whole, entire, undiminished, a sound, unimpaired or perfect condition. Concerning the Bible, integrity means the truth, the honesty, and the permanence of the Bible. You can pick the Bible up at any time, day or night, it will be exactly the same as it was when you put it down last. Maybe dustier, but the words inside will be the same. Now, over the years that uh, I've been preaching the gospel, and that's 24 years now, um, we've got to know different Bibles and things, and we, uh, we believe it is right that you read from the right kind of Bible especially when you are studying. Um, because the Bible that we used is God's word, God's own word to us. And the Old Testament, as you probably know, was translated from the Hebrew and the New Testament from the Greek texts. That's why there's differences between various versions of the Bible, because different people have done the translations. And we seek to convey God's word accurately, so it's important to use the best translation available. And which Bible translation you use is not simply a matter of opinion because it's, the Bibles can be checked for accuracy against the original text or in concordances to find out what the original word meant. Um, I highly recommend as your main study Bible either the King James Bible or the New King James Bible. Uh, we will also uh, recommend the Revised Standard Version, that's a good translation, and the Amplified Bible, for those of you who might not, do you know the Amplified Bible? That's the King James Bible, Amplified. It's not another translation, it's the King James Bible, basically. For, for reference Bibles, we can, you can use any kind of Bible you want for reference. Um, and it's important to know whether the Bible you're using as a reference Bible is a translation or a paraphrase. Uh, paraphrases are things like... Um, the, uh, the living Bible and the message. And the paraphrase simply means a person took a translation and wrote it down in their own words. Scholars, people who know what they're doing, but it's still their own words, not actually a direct translation. So please be careful about which Bible you use and make sure, even if you, even if you have been used to the NIV uh, Bible, uh, you won't get short for doing that, uh, but please make sure that you check what you're reading against the more accurate translation, okay? Then you'll be fine. <coughs> I have some personal test verses in the Bible. Whenever I see a new Bible I've not come across before, and I check these test verses out and make sure they... And they're the ones that always, always seem to fall foul if there's a, if there's a problem with it. I won't, I won't tell you what they are now. We haven't got, really got time. What I want to see is what the people of the Bible have said about the Bible. Jesus said in Matthew 24, 35, Heaven and earth may pass away, but my words shall not pass away. That sounds like a lot of integrity there. Uh, in John chapter 1, verse 1 says, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And verse 14 says, And the Word was made flesh, and dwelt among us, and we beheld his glory, the glory as the only begotten Son of the Father. So, Jesus is the Word of God. And every time you pick up the Word of God to read it, you're, you're picking up Jesus effectively because everything about him is in there. 
In Psalm 119, David said, Forever, O Lord, thy word is settled in heaven. And I love that. It's settled in heaven. It's not settled down here where anybody can get at it and change it. And all. It's settled in heaven, in a place where nobody can access it, except the people who've already gone and uh, believed in it anyway. Paul said in Hebrews 13, 8, Jesus, the word, Jesus Christ, the word, the same yesterday, today, and forever. I absolutely love that scripture because it means that the Bible won't change. So we have to. And do you know if I found out a long time ago, just after I became a Christian, when, I, when the Bible and I are in disagreement, guess who's always wrong? <laughs> <clears throat> when I first became a Christian, uh, I was an atheist at 7.30 in the evening. And at 10 o'clock at night, I was a Christian. Um, and I believed in evolution. And, um, and then I bought, and bought a Bible the following day and started reading it avidly. And uh, nobody told me to be sensible and start in the New Testament and read about Jesus and stuff. So I started in Genesis. Uh, I stopped being an atheist by about uh, chapter 2. I stopped being an evolutionist by about chapter 1. Because I read the Bible and I believed that it was right. And if the Bible was saying it and I didn't believe it, I must be wrong then. So it changes your life, thank God. Peter said in 1 Peter, For all flesh is grass and the glory of man is the flower of grass. The grass withers and the flower thereof falls away. But the word of the Lord endures forever. And this is the word which by the gospel is preached to you. The word of the Lord endures forever. It shall never, ever change. We need to know uh, who it was that wrote and inspired the Bible. First Peter, sorry, Second Peter chapter 1 says, For we have not followed cunningly devised fables, when we made known to you the power and coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, but were eyewitnesses of his majesty. Do you remember Jesus, uh, Peter, James and John were on the Mount of Transfiguration and they actually saw Jesus glorified in front of their eyes? They saw that. For he received from God the Father honour and glory when there came such a voice to him from the excellent glory, this is my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased. So they stood on the Mount of Transfiguration and they have just heard God speak audibly to them. And then they said, and this voice from heaven we heard when we were with him in the holy mount. Then they say, but we have a more sure word of prophecy. Wherein you do well that you take heed as unto a light that shines in a dark place until the day dawn and the day star arise in your hearts. What he's saying is that we are in a place where the word of God is more certain than hearing God speak audibly. You could mishear it. It could be a demon speaking to you. It could be indigestion, you know, and you're thinking it's God speaking. It could be any sort of thing, but the word of God will never change. And anything you hear from God, I'd better line up with the word of God anyway. No prophecy of the scriptures of any private interpretation. God does the interpreting for us and reveals it to us by his spirit. So the, origina the originators of the Bible, can they be trusted? Can you trust the people that wrote the original Bible? In Numbers 23, 19, it says about God, God is not a man that he should lie, neither the son of man that he should repent. Well, that means that everything he writes and everything he causes is, is uh, people to write down will be truthful. But interestingly... Do you believe that every, every word in the Bible is true? Yeah? Because uh, I don't. There are some lies truthfully recorded in the Bible. A pack of stuff in Job and some other things that Peter and some of the other apostles said just aren't true at all. But they were truthfully recorded that they said those words. We've got to know what we're saying here. The Bible is truth, but when you record somebody's lie accurately, it becomes truth, even though they didn't tell the truth. 
Jesus, John 14, 6, Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. He is the truth. He doesn't represent the truth. He's not conveying the truth. He is the truth. And we're looking about the integrity of the Bible. Jesus is it. He is the one that makes the integrity of the Bible. And Jesus said in John 16 of the Holy Spirit, he said, when he, the Holy Spirit, is come, he will guide you into all truth. When he, the Spirit of truth, is come, rather, he will guide you into all truth. He's the Spirit of truth. So you've got Jesus who is the truth, and the Spirit of truth, and God who cannot lie. I believe the Bible's right. About Paul, because he's one of the originators of the Bible, because he wrote two-thirds of the New Testament. In 2 Peter, Peter says, And I want you to consider that the long-suffering of our Lord is salvation, as also our beloved brother Paul, according to the wisdom given to him, has written to you. As also in all his epistles, speaking in them of these things, in which are some things hard to understand, which untaught and unstable people twist to their own destruction, as they do the rest of the Scriptures. It takes a while for that to sink in. It did with me when I first read it. What Peter, one of the disciples who was with Jesus, is saying, that Paul's writings are the same as the other Scriptures. So Peter is talking about Paul's writing like the rest of the Scriptures. He's saying it's just Scripture like the rest of it. He's not saying, I've heard people say, ah, yeah, but that was just Paul. Uh, yeah, yeah, I know it says in the Bible, that, that was just Paul saying that. Well, Peter, one of, the, one of the Lord's apostles, said, his is Scripture. When you're reading Paul, you're reading Scripture. Is the Bible still valid today? It's been around a long time, you know. In James 1.22, you've, you've heard it said already, but be ye doers of the word, and not hearers only, deceiving yourselves. The devil has a day off when we hear the word and don't do it. He just sits back and laughs because we are deceiving ourselves. He doesn't need to do anything at all. When we put the word of God into practice, it will work. And in Mark 16, you'll, you'll know this scripture. And these signs shall follow them that believe. In my name they shall cast out devils, they shall speak with new tongues. They shall take up serpents, and if they drink any deadly thing, it shall not hurt them. They shall lay hands on the sick, and they shall recover. So then after the Lord has spoken to them, he is received up into heaven and sat on the right hand of God. And they went forth and preached everywhere, the Lord working with them and confirming the word with signs following. Signs followed the believers because the believers were speaking the word of God. And at the end it says... The Lord worked with them, confirming the word with signs following. When a believer lays hands on the sick person and says, be healed in Jesus' name, that believer has no power whatsoever to heal that person. But the words that they speak has. We, we have I've laid hands on a lot of people and they've been healed, but I don't have any power to heal anybody of anything. But when I obey the word of God and convey the word of God out there, when I say lay hands on the sick, when I say you're healed in Jesus' name, you will be in the name of Jesus. In John chapter 10, Jesus is saying, if you're struggling with what I'm writing, listen to this, if you do not do the works of my Father, do not believe me. If I do not do the works of my Father, do not believe me. But if I do, though you don't believe me, believe the works that you may know and believe that the Father is in me and I in him. He said, if you're even struggling with believing the words I'm telling you, believe what I do. And that will show you I'm from Father. We need to become word-minded. We need to be thinking about the word of God when it comes to situations. Psalm 138 verse 2 says, I will worship towards your holy temple and praise your name for your loving kindness and your truth, for you have magnified your word above all your name. Think about that for a second. God has magnified his word above his name. His word is more important to him than his name is. 
And that's important for us to recognise that the Word of God has the power in it. You can talk about Jesus and you can talk about God and people use them as swear words and all sorts of stuff. It's ridiculous. But the power is in the Word itself. You can excuse somebody who's swearing and using blasphemous words because they don't know any different. They're being led by the devil. But the word that you speak when you're praying for them will be much more effective than what they're doing because you can speak the word of God over them. Now on there you've got a thing about it. So can you see that bit where it says make this your statement of faith? Can you all find that bit? Well, let me, let's say this together then, shall we? The Bible is true whether I believe it or not, whether I understand it or not. Now that is so important for us to know. If you don't understand something in the Bible, it's still right. If you don't believe something in the Bible, it is still right. I've heard people say, well, it says it in the Bible and I believe it and that settles it. No, it says it in the Bible and that settles it, whether you believe it or not. We have to know that. We have to know that when we're believing the Word of God, we're believing the Word of God because it is the Word of God and not because we think it's a good scripture. Not because we like it. There's lots of scriptures in here that I still pass over quite quickly because I, I don't like that, you know, I'm still not sure about them. I'm thinking, Lord, you still expect me to be like that all the time? I'm supposed to love my, all of my enemies all the time? And do good to those who despitefully use me. God, what else have you got to say, Lord? What else is there in here? <laughs> now don't tell me you haven't thought that as well. Now, just to, so there isn't any confusion, I, I was asked during this, um, during this term to teach this in four lessons, whereas last time I did it in five. So we will be overlapping slightly. So now we've just gone over into the top of lesson two. There is a permanence about the word of God. In Genesis 1, it said, And God said, Let there be light, and there was light. In the Hebrew, it says, Light be, light was. The instant that God had finished saying, Light be, it was there. And all the way through Genesis, and God said, and God said, and God said. God was speaking the word, and it became something. In Hebrews 11.3, it says, Through faith we understand that the worlds were framed by the word of God, so that things which are seen were not made of things which do appear. Isn't that funny? That's what... Cindy was saying that we're supposed to believe stuff we can't see. And God, God is telling us here that he made the world from stuff that you can't see. God's words cre can contain creative power. God's words contain creative power. When he speaks them out, they have created power within them. And I want you to know that when you speak his words out in faith, they have the same creative power in them. I heard about some scientists who, as you know, they're really moving on with knowing about genetics and DNA and all that kind of stuff. But these, these scientists uh, went to God and they said, we have discovered how to create man from the dust of the earth like you did. And he said, oh, that's brilliant. Show me then. So they all got together and they got some dust and God said, hang on a second, what are you doing? So we've got the dust and, and we're going to make man. He said, no, 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 no you get your own dust. <laughs> God created the dust of the earth out of nothing. He just said, dust be, dust was. And we're still struggling with dust. <laughs> In Matthew 12, it says, 
For by your word you will be justified, and by your word you will be condemned. What comes out of your mouth cre contain creative power for the positive or for the negative. I heard somebody once who had done a parody on the, the Beatitudes, the Sermon on the Mount. And uh, for one of them he said, Blessed are those who do not expect to receive anything, for they shall not be disappointed. <laughs> if you don't believe in healing, don't worry about it, you won't get well. If you don't believe in stuff, it won't happen to you. You've got to be speaking this stuff out for it to become real in your life. In John 6, verse 63... This is Jesus speaking. He said, The words I speak to you, they are spirit and they are life. They don't have spirit. They don't have life. They are life. So when we speak his words, it doesn't alter the fact they are spirit and life. It doesn't alter that fact at all. I don't know how you got uh, born again, but... When I got saved, it was as a result uh, of me speaking words. And most people, when I've prayed with them to be saved, to be born again, I just get them to repeat a few words after me because they don't know what to say. You're probably in that position yourself. And somebody leads you through a prayer, and all it is is a bunch of words. But they're the right words. And the right words conveyed from the heart to God cause a change inside that person and they become a new person. They're born again. I don't know about you, but at the end of that, I'm rather pleased with what God's done because he's created a new person right in front of me, right there. And that's awesome. We have creative power in our lives. Jeremiah 1.12 says, I will hasten my word to perform it. God doesn't hang about if you think he hung about, you should read the first few verses of Genesis and see how long it took him to create all this. But you know, it might have taken God six days to create the world and then had a day, a day of rest. But you know when it was he decided that he loved you so much he wanted you in his family? Before he made that, before he made the world, the Bible says that before he framed the world, he chose you to be part of his family. So he, he loves you so much, he wants you to be part of his family before he even made the world for you to live on. I think that is awesome. I love it. <clears throat> There's a phrase that I heard so long time ago and I like to use, the absolute truth. Now you, you say, if you hear that from a politician, you know it won't be. But there is a thing about absolute truth. I don't know if you, in, uh, in science, I don't know if you've heard of the phrase, there's a, 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 um, a temperature called absolute zero. And um, I forget, it's 200 and something or other. Yeah, quite a few degrees down there. And it is the temperature at which it's not possible to extract any more heat and it to get any colder. It can't happen. That's as low as it goes. There's an absolute limit on how cold something can go. With the Word of God, this is an absolute truth. If I was to bring something into here and show you and say, yeah, this looks nice, but it was very expensive. Some of you might go, how much did it cost? And I'd say, this was 40 quid. You go, well, it's not expensive, that's cheap. And somebody go, 40 quid? I couldn't afford that. This is very expensive is a relative phrase. It's not an absolute phrase. The price of it would be absolute, but if it is expensive or not expensive, is dependent upon how you perceive money. Have you got a lot of it or haven't you got much? So whether you believe something in the Bible shouldn't depend on how we are. It should just depend on the Bible itself. There are many truths in the world, but there's only one absolute truth, and it's the Word of God. Hebrews 4.12 says, For the word of God is quick and powerful 
and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the dividing asunder of soul and spirit, of the joints and marrow, and as a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. The Word of God can divide between truth and absolute truth. There's been lots of occasions in our lives where we've had to, my wife and I, we, as running a church, we've had to know whether what we are being told is the truth or not. And when you're having a conversation with somebody, when we're having a conversation with somebody and it's important that we know that what they're telling us is the truth, we are at the same time having another conversation with the Holy Spirit. And because he's the spirit of truth, he knows whether they're telling the truth or not. So we can be led by God to know what is the absolute truth about a situation or not. The doctor may, you might go see a doctor, and your doctor will tell you that you're sick. What will the Bible tell you? That you're healed. Not long after I first became a Christian, I was in the army, and I was over in Germany. And we were on exercise, <clears throat> as we often were, and uh, we'd borrowed a, a, a German army uh, training barracks that they didn't use anymore, so they used to let, let other people borrow it. And we had a particularly tough day, and we got back to the barracks after we'd had something to eat to get ready for bed and have us a bit of a sleep before an early start in the morning. And my friend Julian, we were both sergeant majors in the army, and my friend Julian said to me, he said, uh, do you want a lem sip, one of these lem sips? Because he was streaming with the cold and a bit blocked up. And I had similar symptoms in my body. And he said to me, do you want one of these lem sips? I said, no, thank you, I'm healed. Now, he, he wasn't a Christian just yet. Or rather, I think actually he'd just become one. And um, he wasn't too sure about things. So he says, don't be ridiculous. He says, you're, you're blocked up, your eyes are running, your nose is streaming. How can you say you're healed? I said, well, my body is saying I'm sick. The Bible says I'm healed. One of them's lying. <laughs> and that's a fact. If the Bible says by stripes you were healed, then you is now. And if your body is telling you, it is lying to you. And we are so used to taking as absolute truth what our body is telling us when it's actually a lie. You know, we might wake up with a start in the middle of the night and some noise going on outside. Oh, I wonder what that was. It was probably just a cat or something, you know. We don't have to worry about things like that. God's looking after us. In John chapter 14, verse 6, I'm just going to repeat this again. It's important for us to remember. Jesus said, I am the truth. If you don't go away from anything from what I'm saying tonight, just take that on really on board. Jesus said, I am the truth. I'm just going to finish with this rather important scripture in John chapter 8, verses 31 and 32. Then said Jesus to those Jews which believed on him, If you continue in my word, then are you my disciples indeed, and you shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. Many people I know quote, misquote this, and they say, Ah, oh, yeah, but the truth will set you free. And I say, Oh, no, it won't. And they go, Yes, it says so in the Bible. I said, No, it doesn't say that at all. You have to completely read this in context. Look at these words. Then said Jesus to the Jews which believed on him. Point number one. You have to be a believer. If you continue in my word. So if the believers continue in his word. Point number two. Then that makes you my disciples. So they've, they've, they've been believers, they've continued in the world, and now they're his disciples. People who are believers, continued in the word, and are his disciples will know the truth. If you haven't been a believer and continued in the word and been his disciples, you won't know the truth. 
Because it's only when you get to that point that the truth shall make you free. A statement like, oh, the truth will set you free. I, I don't agree with that. Because for most people, they're not believers who have continued in the word, become his disciples and known the truth. You have to have gone through those steps for any, word, any truth in the word of God to set you free. I know whole churches who don't believe that God heals people. Why don't they believe that? Nobody ever teaches them. So the truth doesn't set them free because they don't know it. And the reason they don't know it is because they're not disciples. And the reason they're not... I'm going backwards up this verse, have you noticed? <laughs> yeah, and the reason they're not disciples is because they haven't continued in his word. And the reason they haven't continued in his word is they're not really believers in the first place. Do you see what I'm saying? So when somebody says to you, you know, oh, well, the truth will set you free, you say, whoa, that's conditional. You know? All of God's promises are available to, to every person. But almost every promise he's got has got a condition attached to it. And the being set free has got the condition of knowing the truth, of being his disciple, of continuing in the word and being a believer. Then you can happily state that truth will set me free. But notice the exact words of Jesus. The last few words in that verse, he said, you shall know the truth and the truth shall set you free. He didn't just say truth will set you free. He said the truth will set you free. The truth, that's God's absolute truth in the word of God. And Jesus is the word of God and has absolute integrity. Thank you.